right? They were hiding in the bushes. And the ticket line went from the Hollywood Bowl almost down to Hollywood Boulevard on that morning. You can imagine that. And so I had a lady working with me named Terry Brown, and she was in the box office, and she said to the box office guy, <laughs> she said, can we sell it out today? He said, heck not, but you can't sell it out in one day, for God's sake, said, maybe in a week. You're not gonna sell it out in one day. About noon time, he went to Terry, and he said, uh, we uh, sold out. You can't buy another ticket. <laughs> Can't buy me love Tomorrow. Tomorrow? This went on for a week, and I never could get the guy on the phone. So there used to be an act called Chris Montez, and I knew his manager, Jim Lee, and I knew that Chris had gone to London, and the Beatles had opened for him. So I said to Jim, I said, will you go over to London and try to talk to this guy about a second show? And he said, sure. So we buy a ticket for him. He goes over to London. He talks to Brian, he meets with Brian, and he calls me and he says, Bob, it's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. I said, I can't believe we sold it out in three and a half hours. And, and I gotta tell you something, everybody, everybody wanted to get in the act. I'm gonna jar your memory if you're over 50. During World War II, there was a, a, a gentleman named Walter Winchell. And I remember as a little boy, we would sit at the radio and we'd listen about the news of the war. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, let's go to press. Walter Winchell was a huge guy. And he was in 64 writing a, a column for one of the local newspapers. And he put in his column that he had under good authority, there would be a second show. <laughs> oh my gosh. The Hollywood Bowl went crazy. Thousands of kids showed up. They went nuts. It just went nuts. And so I found out he was at the Ambassador Hotel. And uh, I called him up and I said, Mr. Winchell, before I tell you why I'm calling, I want you to know how important you were to my family and I during the war. We would sit and listen and listen to your words and they were so important to us. Yeah. I said, well, the reason I'm calling is I want to tell you that I'm the, the promoter and the producer of the Beatles concert at the Hollywood Bowl, and uh, I, I want you to know that there will not be a second show. He said, go to hell. <laughs> I hung the phone. He hung up the phone on me. I was, anyway. And then Bob Craig on Hogan's Heroes. Well, Bob Craig was a disc jockey over KNX at the time. And he, he put on the air one day that he had, under good authority, there were some counterfeit tickets. Oh my God, the guys at the Hollywood Bowl just went nuts. So I couldn't get the second show, I couldn't talk to Brian, it was just pandemonium. But I heard that Brian was coming to LA. So what I did is I offered to GAC, I offered my the lady working for me, Terry Brown, to show, show for him around town. Now, Terry was driving a 63 Ford Falcon <laughs> with a headliner that was ripped and coming down. And she hauled him around and she could call him Brian. He says, I'm Mr. Epstein. And this went on and on. So I found out that he was staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel, in one of the bungalows there at the, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So I called and made an arrangement to go over and meet him. And I took my attorney at the time, and we went over there and knocked on the door. And this guy answers the door, and I said, we have a meeting with Mr. Epstein. He said, well, Mr. Epstein's in the bathroom. He'll be out in just a few moments. I said, okay with me. So pretty soon, Brian comes out, and his flies open. <laughs> and boy, was he embarrassed. 
And I gotta tell you, I could have gotten anything from Brian Epstein at that time. That's how embarrassed he was. Anything, except a second show. He was afraid, at least is what he said, not true, that they couldn't sell it out. I said, come on, Brian. I said, let me put the tickets on sale for the second show now. He said, no, you can't do that. President of Capitol Records wanted to have a big charity thing, and so the second concert would have gotten in the way. But it was amazing, you know, uh, Sinatra's office called, they wanted 20 tickets. Now, you remember Luella Parsons, she was a big gossip columnist. See, this is my first concert, I didn't hold back enough seats, so I put Luella Parsons in the last row of the Hollywood Bowl, and she never let me forget it. And then I was doing a dance party show over Channel 5 and I traded Michael Landon some tickets for him appearing on my dance party show. He didn't like that, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but it, 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 it truly was a, a crazy time. Now, when they arrived in Los Angeles, they wanted to stay at the Ambassador Hotel. But the Ambassador Hotel said, no, we don't want them. Because we know all about that chaos and all, all of that. And, and the Hollywood Bowl, they were so fearful of what was going to happen because they had the neighbors up there and everything that they threatened to cancel the show. This is after we had sold the tickets. Their, their law firm of I.B. Kornblum uh, told them that you better not cancel it. You're going to get sued because they really had no reason to cancel at that time. So Capitol Records found them a huge uh, Hollywood-style mansion in Bel Air, and it belonged to a guy named Reginald Owen. But they had to pay a lot of money. For the three days they were in town, they had to pay a thousand dollars for it. <laughs> but, but anyway, Alan Livingston arranged all of that. So then uh, the contract read that you had to do a press conference at every concert. So what I did is we set our press conference. It was going to be at our Cinnamon Cinder nightclub. And uh, we put the, the, letter, the word out just to get reporters in there, but oh my God, the word got out. But they were wonderful, and they, they were so glib. Uh, and I, I remember a reporter asked Paul, who would you like to meet while you're here? And he said, Jane Mansfield. <laughs> and he wanted to meet Jane Mansfield. And so anyway, there were girls everywhere because the word had gotten out. So on the side of the cinnamon center, there was a, we had a, a, a limousine waiting. Now, that limo was pointed that way, and Ventura Boulevard is that way, but when you pull out, you can't see cars coming from the left or from the right. So these girls were all over the car. We peeled the girls off and everything, and I said, get out of here. And the limo driver drove out onto Ventura Boulevard blindly, not seeing anything from the left or from the right. And I gotta tell you, had there been a car coming, we would not be sitting here tonight, I can tell you that for sure. But we finally got them out. We got up to the Hollywood Bowl, and there were 18,000 kids there waiting for them, and there probably another 5,000 on the, on the hills behind, up in the trees and everywhere. It, 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 was, it was just crazy, it really was. And the back room at the dressing room, it was nuts. And interestingly enough, every time that I would ask Brian a question, he would say, well, you gotta ask John. You gotta ask John. And I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was obvious to me at that time that John Lennon was sort of the, the boss of, of the group, really. Uh, but it, it was difficult backstage. And I remember I was backstage and Debbie Reynolds, famous actress at the time, came with a security guard up to me and she said, I would love to meet the Beatles. I just think they're wonderful. I'm th I just, and I said, well, I'm sure there won't be a problem. So I walk into the dressing room, and there's John Lennon, Lennon sitting with Lauren Bacall. <laughs> and I said, John, there's a very famous actress out there who wants to meet you. She said she just loves you guys so much. 
And he looked at Bacall, and Bacall went, nah. And he says, we don't want to meet her. I said, you don't want to meet Debbie Reynolds? Nope. I said, but John, John, she says that, that she loves you. One, two. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the Hollywood Bowl, and when you're a promoter of rock concerts, uh, you always have a big problem, you did then, with, with the kids rushing and trying to get to the, to the artists and such. So we brought the Beatles into the Hollywood Bowl in, in a limousine, the same one that left the Settlement Center at the press conference. But we knew we had to get creative in getting them out of there. So on the stage left side of the Hollywood Bowl, there was a little bitty driveway, and it had bushes on both sides. And in 1964, there was only one compact car. It was a Chrysler Barracuda. And that's all it was there. So I got a hold of this Chrysler dealer, and I said, we want to borrow your Barracuda to try to get the Beatles out of the Hollywood Bowl. He said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. He said, if you can get a picture of the Beatles in our 1964 Chrysler Barracuda, I'll give the car to you. I said, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, all three years they performed, the Beatles only performed on stage for 30 minutes. 30 minutes, that's all. No encore, just 30 minutes. And they always ended the concert with Little Richard's Long Tall Sally. And I couldn't figure that one out until recently we did some research on it. Come to find out, Long Tall Sally was the first song that Paul uh, McCartney ever recorded. So I asked John, I said, John, do me a favor, please don't say this is your last number. He said, oh, no, 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 we have to do that. He said, but I promise you one thing, we'll get out early. I, I promise you we'll hurry. I said, okay. So they said, this is your last number. They sang the song, Long Tall Sally, Little Richard, put their instruments down, jumped into the little barracuda, sailed down the driveway. The LAPD had the cars held on Highland. And I will tell you, within 30 seconds of leaving the stage, they got on the freeway. I had a limo and a photographer waiting at Sunset Boulevard in Van Ness. That's where the Denny's is right now. And meanwhile, the, the kids demolished the limo. They thought they were gonna get back in the limousine. I mean, they demolished it. And then some of the kids actually took a little swim that night too at the Hollywood Bowl and had to be fished out. <laughs> it was, uh, it was really strange. Uh, oh, uh, needless to say, uh, here's the picture of the Beatles. Uh, I didn't get the Barracuda, <laughs> so it didn't work out. Remember when I told you that John wanted to meet Jane Mansfield? Well, she had heard about that. So she went over to their house, got in somehow, and uh, made an arrangement for them all to go to the place there on Sunset Boulevard, the Whiskey A Go Go. And uh, you've been there, I'm sure. So they made an arrangement to go there, but, but Paul, who wanted to be Jane Mansfield, had a date with Peggy Lipton that night. Okay. So he couldn't make it. So the other three were taken to the Whiskey A Go Go, and Jane Mansfield had a booth set up all by herself and everything. But there was an empty booth next to him. And when they walked in, the photographers went crazy. Someone had tipped them off, and they went nuts. And they finally got all of the photographers away, and they got them all away, and, 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 and it was just pandemonium. And George got very upset, because one photographer would not leave. He was right there in George's face. And he used that English term, bugger off, dude. I don't think he said dude, but anyway. <laughs> and, and the guy wouldn't move, so George took his drink and he threw it. And the photographer ducked. Now, the booth next to the Jane Mansfield, what nobody realized is that Tippy Hedren had come in and was sitting in the booth next to Jay Mansfield. So, so when John threw the drink, the photographer ducked and the drink hit Tippy Hedren and just drowned her. And Mansfield said, let's get the heck out of here. And they did. And uh, that was the story of 64. So what I did is I put together a profit and loss statement. <laughs> You're going to love this one. And remember, the tickets are $3 to $7, right? I had to pay the Beatles $25,000 plus 60% over $50,000.
The Hollywood Bowl took 15% of the gross sales. I had stagehands and security. And then in the afternoon, a busload of marshals came in. And I said, what are you guys doing here? He said, well, we're here to protect the neighbors up there. I said, oh, good, fine. I said, who's paying for you? He said, you are. <laughs> I am. So when you put it all together with that, the advertising, we ended up netting on the 1964 concert four thousand dollars and I swore that I would never do another Beatles concert because folks it was just too difficult <laughs> One, two, three, four.